Hi guys and welcome to uh, Physics 10. Today is May 6th. Okay, so we have uh, quite a few material to cover, so I'm going to get right into it. Basically, we're dealing with the light. It is a little bit of uh, color theory. I really honestly don't think there is a lot of physics in there. We're going to talk a little bit about it, at least so that you have an understanding of what color is. And then we're going to talk mainly about reflection, refraction. Those are the two main things that we're going to be talking about, basically uh, for uh, for uh, for uh, for light. This part of physics is called optics, okay, and that is basically a study of how light um, uh, travels from point to point to point to point. Okay, there are two kinds of optics. There is the geometrical optics, which is really what we're talking about, and there is another one called wave optics. So at some point, probably we're going to get to a little bit of wave optics. So let me share with you the screen. We move this a little bit closer in here. So again, these are the topics. Color in our world. Apparently, we have we, we are sensitive to uh, to certain frequencies. A, a, a range of frequencies that is basically what the visible light is okay from the uh, different kinds of uh, uh, emissions from the electromagnetic spectrum so we are only sensitive to a small range of it uh, again how to mix colors why the sky is blue why in the evening it's orange and so on and so forth and uh, the main thing in here for this chapter is actually the second part in here we'll talk about the reflection the law of reflection, the law of refraction. And in between them, there is a principle of least time. It gives us, if you wish, justification for why there is such a thing. I mean, if you stand in front of the mirror, you're going to see a, uh, and if you look, for example, down to your toe, you're going to see a toe on the opposite side that has the same size, and it's the same distance from the mirror on the other side as you are. Look at your hand, for example, the same thing. There is a hand on the other side that looks like your hand, and it's located with the exception of the right left being inverted, everything else is the same. So that is basically what we mean by the law of reflection. So what's going on in here is actually there is nothing on the other side of the screen, of the mirror. If you don't believe me, just ask somebody who's standing behind it do you see me on the other side? They will tell you no, okay? So what's going on? What's going on in this case is the light that is coming from your toe in the first case bounces off of the mirror and then comes to your eye in such a way that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection, uh, giving you the illusion that the image actually came straight out because that's how our eyes basically are conditioned. We know that light travels in a straight path. So you think that light actually did not really reflect off of the surface, but came through from the other side of the uh, surface. So this is basically how image is formed on a flat screen, on a flat surface, okay? Uh, that principle also works with any kind of surface. It doesn't have to be a, uh, a uh, flat. You could have concave mirror like this, or concave mirror like this, basically. And those two, they form images. So image formation is a big topic in here that you would want to understand. Excuse me. In terms of refraction, uh, when you look, for example, down on, on the surface of water and you see uh, the, the rays break down, for example, there is a stick, for example, you put it in, you see it breaking down. That is what we call refraction, the bending of light in passing from one medium to a different medium. That can lead to devices like this one. This is actually a, a, a magnifying uh, lens. And this is actually a converging lens. This is on the opposite side of it is actually a diverging lens. It's similar except that the, it's, it's really bent in the opposite direction both ways. So this is a diverging the other one. So lenses are very important because what we use for our glasses are actually lenses, okay? And their lenses, in this case, actually, it's a combination. On this side, it's convex. On the other side, it's concave, actually. And that is used for, 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 for uh, corrections, for example, for optical uh, issues. 
And also it can be used for telescopes or microscopes for magnifications. I have in here actually binoculars that use the same principle. You have in here the eyepiece. So what is the cover for that? Okay. And you have in here the principle basically a mirror that collects, I mean, lens that collects the light and where it goes through. So this is some of the optical devices that are used actually. And I lost the cover here somewhere. Uh, that are used for uh, using these principles. Again, that uses the refraction. It doesn't use the reflection, okay? And we're gonna talk about the dispersion, basically when you have a white light coming through a, uh, a medium, like for example, in case of refraction, uh, the, the, the light then depending on its wavelength. And this leads to the concept of rainbows, actually. That's how rainbows are formed. Uh, dispersion is very important because you can use it actually for analysis of light that is coming from a source in uh, spectroscopic uh, analysis. And what you do in this case is, if there is light that is emitted or uh, uh, absorbed, you can find the specific frequencies or specific wavelengths that are either present or missing depending on the type of spectrum that you're analyzing. So this is very important stuff in terms of uh, studying uh, things, whether in the, uh, in the uh, laboratory or in astronomy or whatever you have that you want to, uh, to, uh, to uh, study. Again, I mentioned lenses and their detects. Again, this is basically a, uh, The, the, the type of color that you see sometimes depends on the brain. Sometimes it's very hard to interpret that. I mean, what looks like to me red probably doesn't look to you too that red. It may be even different shade of red or a different, different color. As a matter of fact, there are people who are completely colorblind. So this is there is a perception element in here when it comes to color. So color sees, depends on the frequency. Lowest frequency perceived is red. The highest frequency that we can perceive is the violet. Anything outside of that is not, you cannot see. Ultraviolet, you cannot see it. Uh, I mean, it can be damaging to the skin. As a matter of fact, it can be, if it's too much UV radiation, that can be very, very uh, damaging. X-rays also, they're even high, longer wavelengths, I mean, shorter wavelengths, uh, more energetic, more frequency, and also uh, gamma rays. On the other side of it, the infrared also you cannot see them. Infrared, uh, you feel them as heat and then microwaves and the other longer wavelength. So this is basically what we see is anywhere between violet and red and the different shades of the different colors in between, okay? Can a human eye see the infrared? Absolutely not. The ultraviolet, no. So neither of these two are possible. So the correct answer is D. No. Not C, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. See, sometimes this is actually a very good point, okay? You guys need to read the question, okay, sometimes. And this is true for the exams. The question is, what can the human eye not see? We cannot see the infrared. We cannot see the ultraviolet. Hence, C is the correct answer because we cannot see A and B, okay? So again, we will see it if it reflects light. That's why the same rose, for example, at night, you cannot see it because there is no light for it to reflect. As a matter of fact, you can see anything at night, uh, complete darkness, because there is no light for, uh, for anything to reflect off of it. That's why you can't see. It's not that the objects are missing all of a sudden. It's the fact that the light is missing. Since the light is missing, then in this case, you can see the, ob the, same, the very same objects, okay? So in this case, how is color is happening? For the red, for example, it absorbs all radiation with the exception of red. Red is actually being reflected. So that's why you see the object in here is in red color. If, uh, if it absorbs all radiation, it should appear completely black in this case, okay? So you have some filters for different colors. I have some 
color filters in here. Let's use that same principle I was talking about in here. Here I have three filters. This is, what is this one? Violet, maybe, blue, and then you have green. I actually have different filters in here somewhere else. Too. Bunch of filters. So. And I have actually some more. So these are what this, this picture is the, doing in here. So when you look through each and every one of them, so what you're seeing is everything, I mean, you're seeing just that frequency that's being transmitted. So this is transmission, not uh, unlike the other one, which is uh, which was by reflection, okay? So versus, so this is how I would like when only the red light is transmitted, but if it's a green, this is how it's going to look like. As a matter of fact, for the most part, I'm basically being, uh, uh, but now for both of them, because one of them is absorbing everything except green, and the other one is observing green. So at this point, you shouldn't see anything. Okay, so this one is transmitting only green and absorbing everything else. And this one is transmitting only this color and absorbing everything else, including green. So if I combine them, now they're gone in either side. Okay, so this is how that principle, you can easily demonstrate it. So there is a law in here, how light is basically, this, depending on, of course, the uh, temperature, there's, there's this, this frequency peaks around a certain uh, value in here for all, the, uh, for, for all different frequencies. Because the sun has this property, it peaks around this, this middle in here, around the green color, actually, the yellow color. The sun is a combination of all of these frequencies. And this is probably why we evolved to be sensitive just to this range of colors. Okay, our eyes evolved to be more sensitive just to this range of colors. Other animals don't see, for example, colors well, like for example, dogs. They have different range of colors. Okay, so the red and the and the and the and the uh, blue for them they appear to be the same color. For the most part, you have the green, the red, the blue. Which, when you combine them, you're going to get all the different colors. So. Here is the, the different colors that you when you combine them. Combine the green and the, and the uh, blue and you get the cyan color. The green and the red and you get the yellow color. The red and the blue and you get this indigo color. And now combine all of them and you get the white color. So when I say white light, what I meant with it, all frequencies are, are present. Let's skip through the discussions in here. Hopefully you guys can have. So the subtractive colors are just the opposite to what the RGB colors are. So the RGB colors are green, red, and uh, green, blue, and red. And the other colors are the opposite to that. So a combination of two of the above, red and blue, magenta, did I call it differently? I don't know, I forgot what I called it. Indigo, I don't know, I don't think it's magenta. And uh, yellow and cyan. As a matter of fact, if you worked in, worked in any kind of printing place or have any project to be sent to the printer, and it's a professional printer where they print color, they don't print in the RGB, they print in uh, YMCA, MCK. Y for yellow, M for magenta, C for uh, cyan, and K is for the black. I don't know why they call it K. So again, these are the opposite to the other ones. And here is what I was talking about. The print, printing places, they combine the different colors to give you the true color of the, uh, the object in here. Okay. And here we're going to talk about the sky. This is one of the questions that is usually asked, especially for uh, from middle school students and 
that level, why the sky is blue, and there's all kinds of answers to it. It's not because the ocean is blue. The ocean is blue because the sky is blue, actually. That's the only reason why it is. Otherwise, at night, the sky will change colors. It becomes red, OK? So does the ocean change its color from morning to afternoon? No. So what's going on in this case is because light diffracts differently depending or disperses differently depending on its wavelength, okay? depending on the, uh, the, the frequency, actually. Uh, so what's going on in here is for a, the blue disperses the least, the red disperses the most. Okay? So when, when light comes in, straight out so in this case the blue the blue there is dispersion for the blue but it's not as much as the red the red is being scattered all over the place uh, on the on the on the sidewise so what you see in this case is just the, what is what is what is left from that scattering and that is a blue color when the rays are on top of us immediately when they are coming at an angle it's still true that the blue is going in and out but it's going straight out and now we're looking at the red color, basically, which gives us that sensation of the sky being uh, orange. So that's basically in the morning and in the evening. So that is basically the idea behind it in here. During daytime, this is what's going on in here. The shortest path at noon. So in this case, the, the, the blue color is the least scattered. So it's the, sky, the sky looks blue, hence the oceans look blue. And then as these, the sun starts to move differently in the horizon, the color of the sky changes with it. Changes with it. And in doing so in the evening, uh, we are here, of course. So the sun is already uh, set down from the other side because it's below the horizon. But what is scattered in here is the, the longer wavelength, namely the red. So that is basically what makes the difference between the sky. And again, in here, we're talking about the different colors and the color schemes in here because the water disperses all the different colors in all directions. So the clouds appear white because of the combination of all the different colors. Again, I mentioned the color of the, the oceans and how they are related to the sky. Anyway, so let's get into the second topic, which is very, very important. And that is the law of reflection or actually at least these two laws are given a name. They're called the Snell's laws. They're the law of refraction and the law of reflection. The law of reflection basically, if a light comes in and hits a surface, this is the incident. This is the light that came in. This is reflected. And this is the normal to the surface. So there is a surface in here. And this is a normal to it. What I mean by normal, it makes a 90 degree angle, that's all. This is the angle of incidence and this is the angle of reflection. These two angles are equal. So that is basically what the law of reflection is. This angle and this angle are equal all the time. In other words, if you have all of a sudden an incident wave that is not making this much angle, but it's almost to the normal, closer to the normal, the reflected wave also will be closer to the normal. So this angle and that angle will be the same. So this was observed and you can document this one through experiments and so on and so forth. The law of refraction though is a little bit different. Let me pick up another surface now. So I have a surface now that separates two different media with different properties. One of them is thicker than the other. So what's going on in the thicker one, as light penetrates it, it's going to be absorbed by the atom. The atom gets excited. And then for a moment, the light is not traveling because it's being trapped in that atom. And then the atom would go back to its ground state. When it goes back to its ground state, it's going to emit the same light that it's absorbed. So light, appears to be traveling slower in a material than it is in the air or in vacuum because the atoms of the air are far spaced that this you're not going to see this this phenomenon but in a, in a particular matter the atom this one becomes excited again during that time the light is not traveling and so on and so forth so light appears to be traveling slower in a material than it is in in the air or vacuum and that is because for a good part of it, it's being slowed down by the absorption process. 
if light makes it to the other side, then this medium is actually uh, transparent, like water. You can see what is inside the water because it's transparent or glass. You can see through it. But some materials actually, as light is being transmitted, it's not gonna be transmitted back into the same frequency. So it's gonna be transmitted to a different frequency and light basically is, 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 is diminished as it goes along the material and at the end is going to be completely observed. So that material is not transparent, but opaque. Like the wall, for example. If the, all, everything was transparent, then you have no privacy. Everybody will be, you can see everything everywhere. So in that is opaque materials where they basically block the radiation. So there is a depth with which light can penetrate and after that it's absorbed, okay? So let's take, for example, this is water where we know uh, light will uh, slow down in it. This is again, the normal to it. So if there is an incident wave, and let's say, for example, this is the angle of incidence. Typically, I would think that the light will be going straight through if the two media are the same. So this is water, this is air. But light instead breaks down, it goes at an angle like this one. So in other words, the angle of incidence, which is this one, is not the same as the angle of refraction. There is a relationship, there is a mathematical relationship involving trick functions, involving specifically the sign in here. And something that characterizes how light behaves in a different media. And this is called the index of refraction. The index of a refraction is a measure of how fast light travels in a different a specific medium. In air, the index of refraction is one. It's like the same speed of light, travels with 300,000 kilometers per second. In water, it travels a lot slower. As a matter of fact, the index of refraction for the water is 1.333. So as a matter of fact, travels about, uh, what is it, one over 1.333, is that two thirds? Yeah, okay. It travels about 200,000 kilometers per second. Per, yeah, per second, okay? So uh, that's why the light is broken down in here. So when you look and see a fish in the ocean, let's say for example, there is a fish in here. The fish, the light is, has been refracted to come to your eye in here. So you're looking and seeing a fish. For you, you have the perception in your mind that light travels in a straight path. So for you, this is where the fish is located. but it is not, it's in here actually. So if you try to grab it, by the time you reach out in here, you're not gonna catch anything because it's in here, okay? Well, that is basically the phenomenon of, both phenomenon of reflection and refraction. According to uh, Feynman, this is the only experiment that was documented by the Greeks. Although these two laws are called Snell's laws, but of course they were discovered way before, okay? Uh, the principle of least time of Fermi says the following, basically, that light takes the shortest time to go from point to point, from starting, let's say, from A to B. It takes the shortest time. So light can go like this or can go like this, but the shortest time in this case is going to be straight line. So this is actually how light is going to travel. Well, this principle is handy because then I can understand what's going on with the, with the, with the, with the, uh, with a reflection. If I have, this is my starting point and this is my ending point. Let's say this is the point. The fastest path for light to go through and touching this material. So in here, I'm requiring that it has to go here first. Well, you have two options. Either go straight to the mirror and come back in here. That is option one. Or head it in here right underneath and go there. That's option two. Or you have actually more than two options. You have go around the galaxy and the universe and come back in here. There is another path where this is the path it takes. It goes to this point in here somewhere in the middle and comes back in such a way that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of refraction. It turns out among all paths possible, this is the shortest time, shortest time. or the least time. Same thing, if I have a separation between two media with different indices of refraction, then in this case, and this is the normal, and I want to go from starting point, for example, A, to start to ending point B, I could go straight like this, or I could go here, and then it's like the ocean, for example. 
you would want to go to point B. Let's say, for example, you would want to go to rescue somebody in there. And this is the shoreline, the, the, uh, the beach. And this is the water, the ocean. And you would want to go there. There are so many ways for you to think about it. One way to say, okay, I'm going to go straight through a run, then swim to, uh, to go to rescue that person. Or I'm going to run very shortly here to the beach and then swim this whole length in here. Or I'm a fast runner and slow uh, swimmer. So what I do in this case, I'm going to run all the way here and just swim this distance. So I will have less swim than, than, uh, than, uh, than running. Running because I can run faster, so I can do that. So that's exactly similar in the analogy to running faster in, 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 uh, in, uh, on sand than having to actually do the same thing on water. So that is what the index of refraction really refers to. It turns out, if you do the math correctly, that it's, a com it's somewhere a compromise between the two. You go to a point in here, and you come in here, in such a way that the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction, they're related with the mathematical equation that I mentioned, okay? That the index of refraction times the sine of this angle is equal to the index of refraction of second medium times sine of the other one. It looks complicated, but it's all coming from the same, but it's principle of least time, okay? So again, I mentioned the refraction. So why is it working that way? is because look, the point A, point B and the point B prime is the opposite. If this is like a mirror, this is what it looks like. It's the image of B, prime, B on B on the, on the mirror. So that is B prime. Obviously the path from A to B is the fastest path possible between these two, okay? If I use trig or the angles, this, is an equilateral because of the fact that this distance and this distance are the same since so B and B prime are Im images. Okay. Did I say that? it's an isosceles, it's not an equilateral? So this side and that side are the same, which means that this is all actually and this angle are the same. But this complements this angle. So this angle and this angle are the same. But this angle and this angle are the same because you have this line and that line that's are cutting it. So at the end of the day, this angle and that angle are the same. It's all coming from. Uh, the least time. So the bottom line is the least time justifies the law of reflection and how images are formed on a flat, a flat mirror. Okay, again, angle of incidence is angle bathed by the incoming ray and the perpendicular to the surface. So this is probably a question that you might see in the in an exam. Okay, so again, this is the angle of incidence. It's always the first one. The angle of reflection is the angle of the reflected ray and the perpendicular. So this would be the reflected reflection. Okay, and this is the normal to the surface. It's an imaginary light perpendicular to the plane of the reflecting surface lies in the same plane as that of the incident and reflected rays. So again, here is the same stuff that I was talking about, okay? Law of reflection applies to light, applies to sound, applies to all waves, actually. Obey this, this law, regardless of what type of wave you have. So here is how the image is formed again. So when you stand in front of the mirror, so what's going on? Let's say, for example, this is the head, this is where the eye is, and this is where the leg is. So when you look around in here, for example, okay, to the leg, it looks like this is where the light is coming, hitting the leg and coming to your eye. So in this case, this is the normal to the surface. This angle and that angle are the same. So it appears to you that it's coming from the other side of the mirror, okay? So again, this is an object, I mean, this is the object, and you go point by point to form an image for it. So this is the image. A word that people use a lot when they talk about image formations, and that is 
the, uh, the is the image real or is the image virtual? Obviously, this image is virtual. The reason why it's virtual, because there is no nothing on the other side. As a matter of fact, you take a film, for example, and you expose the film, regardless of how long you expose it, you're not going to develop a, 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 an image of the object. Why? Because there are no rays going, actually, or coming from the other side. All the rays are happening on this side. Hence, this is not a real image because of that fact, because of the fact, not because you just peek around the mirror and you see nobody. No, because there is no real image that can develop out of it. You take a film, for example, and you expose it. Doesn't matter how long you have it exposed. For a short period, a longer period, doesn't matter. And then you go and develop it, there will be no image. It's going to be all burnt, actually if there was too much light on the other side or it stay and it's basically uh, not developed because of the fact that there is no no light hitting it so that is basically one thing so virtual and uh, and real so this is actually a virtual as opposed to real some devices will give you real images this one does not the flat mirror does not okay this image is called in the literature they call it upright because the image is the same direction as that of the object. This is as opposed to your eye, for example. Your eye, the image, first of all, is real because it falls on the retina. So the eye, I mean, the object that you're looking at right now, let's say, for example, you're looking at this pen, okay? So this, the way it, it is right now is that it goes through the eye and the eye projected, there is a lens actually there, projected on the back of the eye, which is the retina. Now the retina, first of all, the image is flipped. So it's inverted in that case. And like this case, which is not inverted, which is upright. In that case, the image actually is inverted. And furthermore, it's shrunk in size actually. It's not the same size. Like this one, the magnification is one. The one for the eye is actually smaller. The magnification is less than one. Obviously, there are some sensors on the retina those sensors, they send a signal, electrical signal through the optical nerve that goes to your brain and your brain gives you what color it is, how far it is, how bright it is, and everything else that has to do with it, okay? So your brain interprets that thing. But remember, the image that forms on your eye, the back of your eye is actually inverted, not like this one, which is upright. So that is something that you have and that image, like I said, is real, because if you can take that lens or any lens for that matter, like this one, and run through it, this one in here, and see where it forms. So I have to find it exactly where it forms. I have to have a source of light. Then in that situation, the image is going to be real. Let me see if I can do this. Okay. You can clearly see, so I'm forming, I'm running the light in here. I'm hoping not to have it in your eyes because this is a very this is a very powerful, powerful laser. Okay, so again, I'm pushing it in here. Okay, why is this not working? Okay, now it is. Okay, you can see the the red dot in here forming on my face, and that is if I have a film in here exposed, it can read. The picture but again i'm just sending one light in here in, in, in each case so i'm going to have just one light i would not have anything else in here and this is similar to the lens that is in your eye similarly let me get a diverging lens oh man i have a lens in here too forgot about this one this is actually another lens in here okay man it's all colors going all over the place and let me get the other lens, the diverging lens. Let's see here how I'm going to do that. The index of the, uh, uh, I mean, the uh, the radius in here, the focal point in here is obviously too big in here. I'm trying to. Never mind that. Okay. Anyway, you got the point, hopefully. So again, this is a flat mirror. On a flat mirror, everything is conserved, namely the height is conserved, namely the magnification is one. Uh, the distances are perfectly uh, fine. I mean, everything is the same. The upright stays upright, unlike the eye, which is inverted. 
the only thing problem is the left and right gets uh, gets mixed up. That's all. Okay, and this is true actually also for our uh, for our uh, cameras too. Oops. In a sense, you can change the left and right. And let me show you. So right now it's a, it's it's a normal video, normal camera. So this is basically how it's going to look like on a mirror. So now the left and right has been inverted. So this is the same thing for me. I'm just keep playing with the left and right in here, inversion. Okay. To see how this would work on your eye, to see on oops, I don't mean to do that. To see how it would work on your eye, let's see here. This is how your eye actually sees things. So imagine the following experiment that was done. Okay. <laughs> imagine the following experiment that was, uh, was, was done. What they did was they took another lens like this one and they put it in front of the eye. And they have corrective lenses for some people where they put these things in here so that the image is inverted through the lens first. So when it goes through the lens of the eye, it's inverted one more time. So it's going to sit upright on the, on the person. It's going to sit normal on the, per the person right now. So when it does that, the person will have the perception that everything is upside down. For a moment, you'll be confused. And the brain, for some reason, initially you'll be confused. People cannot work because the see, you feel like everything, the entire room is upside down because of that corrective lens. So this was an experiment that was conducted. But for some reason, the brain adjusted itself even with that lens and corrected the, uh, the, the image, even though the image is sitting now up, uh, upright on the, on the retina because of that lens. So they did that experiment, okay? It seems like the brain, which is really a very, very complicated device that corrects and does the proper corrections so that people can basically walk. Otherwise, in your eye right now, it's exactly what's going on in the picture that I just showed. And every the eye is like that. But the brain takes all the necessary steps to make sure that the image is fine so that you can walk without having to uh, hit anything. Otherwise, the whole, the whole room will be upside down. The table is upside down. Everything is upside down. And you will be stumbling trying to get anywhere. Okay? Fascinating stuff. So again, uh, the mirrors, they don't necessarily can be... Uh, 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 flat, they can be convex or concave, okay? Depending on how far you are on the concave though. In, in the case of the, in the, case of the uh, convex, the image is always going to be virtual. It's going to be on the other side, okay? On the convex mirror, uh, I'm sorry, a convex mirror, it's always virtual. On concave mirror though, the image can be virtual like in this case, but if you move back, the image starts to be real, to, to be in front of the mirror, okay? So depending on how far you are from something called the focal point. If the focal point, if you are, if the focal point is behind you, then the, uh, the image appears magnified and appears on the other side and appears upright, just like the picture is uh, depicting. But if you are sitting on the focal point, there will be no image. As a matter of fact, the image does has moved all the way to infinity. And if you move any further space, you will see it behind you and it's smaller and it's inverted until, and it moves back until you move so far away from the mirror, the image can only be at the focal point. So this is basically some of the properties of the concave mirror, as opposed to this mirror. And you're here, you are within a focal, uh, other, within a focal point. So the image is upright and it's a, a, a virtual, and it's actually not magnified, which we call it. Uh, it's, uh, its magnification is less than one. And as you move around, this image starts to grow and move with it too, till you have all of the information. Okay. Hopefully, you can play, play with this thing in here. So that you can hopefully have access to some of these things and you can do it in your home. Okay. So, when you look at the side of the mirror of the car, it says that objects on this mirror appear closer than they are closer than they appear. It's because of this. Okay. So 
ref a light reflecting from a smooth surface and there goes a change in frequency? No, it, the frequency does not change. Speed does not change. Wavelength does not change, okay? What changes is actually a phase, that's all. So none of the above. When the surface is not smooth, the scattering can go in all directions. And uh, light basically becomes diffuse. When as the surface is smooth and it's wet, you can see actually the uh, you see reflections, okay? You will see reflections. And because of the heat in the atmosphere, you will see actually the water or whatever that surface becomes wavy. And you think that, hey, there is water actually, even very far, far away from the surface, as long as it's a asphalt surface, you're gonna see water in it. And that's because the reflection of the sky and wavy, so the military, that's the mirage, of course. Refraction, I make to mention the fact that it, you have to have a medium, separation, uh, two media, you have to have a separation between them. And this is again, the angle of incidence and that is the angle of reflection, uh, refraction, okay? And these two angles are not e uh, equal, okay? So this is the point I was talking about in here in terms of how this analogy works. So if you want to rescue this drowning person, the best bet is there is a law that you need to find. So uh, for the person who took this class, what they need is to find the arc sign of the ratio of the index of refraction over this one and this angle in here that they need to work with. Once they find that, they can find the least time and they can jump into and find the person that was drowning the fastest. Uh, when light scatters, again, is going to, I mean, uh, diffracts, the incoming light and the outgoing light are going to be parallel to one another because they diffract once and one more time, and the emerging is going to be at the same angle as the, or the incoming, albeit uh, displaced in this case. So I mentioned the fact that light travels slower in glass than in air. You have to be careful with this word in here. It appears to be traveling slower. Light always travels with the speed of light. It's only because of the fact that it's absorbed for a moment, it's not traveling, that's all. This is a fun experiment. I wish I had, you can do this one in here. Put, put, put a coin, for example. Uh, that's why I have coins in here. Do not bring a cup with me. Put a coin in a cup, okay? coffee cup and move back so that you don't see the coin and fill it with water. And because of the refraction, as the water level starts to rise and the light is diffracted from that water, you will see the coin without even having to move. So put it in the cup, move back, look at the cup and you will not see the, uh, the, the coin as long as the cup is not clear, okay? Don't try it with a clear cup because it's gonna be uh, obvious, okay? You can see the coin. But as you pour the water in, then at some point the cups, are, uh, the coin starts to appear. Okay, the index of refraction n is a measure of how fast light travels in the medium. Okay, so n is equal to the speed of light in vacuum, which is three hundred thousand kilometers per second over the speed of light in the material. So that's basically in a nutshell. So the speed of light over inside a material is that of the speed of light in vacuum divided by N. And since this is a top, N must be more than one. It can never be less than one or equal to one for the, it's only equal to one for the case of air and vacuum. So this is the analogy that I gave in before for the fish, okay? The fish appears to be closer to the surface, appears to be coming from this side, but it is actually here.
again, the, this uh, diffraction in here gives you the, uh, the, the impression that the light is, uh, sun is coming from here, but the sun probably has gone below the uh, below horizon. This is another thing that I mentioned, the mirage. When you're looking at the surface in here, it appears that because of the heat actually in this case, it appears that there is actually a reflection in here and you can see, see, see things on the other side in that. So this is true for all waves, okay? Now the dispersion, as I mentioned before, the dispersion depends on the frequency of light in this case, okay? So the dispersion depends on the frequency and because of that, that is what you're going to be seeing in the uh, different uh, lights. So this is how rainbows form, actually. So you have a sunlight uh, that is white light. And because white light is goes in, first of all, it's broken down into two different colors. So the red is in here, and then you have the blue in there. But now the law of reflection comes in. So there is a refraction, and there is a reflection. And there is another refraction. So this is a double refraction uh, phenomenon. So it's a reflection, refraction, a refraction, a reflection, refraction. So that is basically how a single rainbow is formed, OK? So in this case, you have the light that is coming out of it completely is going to be separated. And you will see the blue on one side and the red on the other side. That's how rainbows form. As a matter of fact, when you're standing in here, all you see is from two different basically droplets of water, because this is the droplet of water, the different lights that are coming from it. And you, it looks like the light is being broken down. And you see that formation in there, red all the way to blue. And see, this is how it appears to you, especially when the air has this moisture in it. You can clearly see different rainbow formations in here, wherever you are in the horizon. And it's actually a big circular shape in there. It's a big circle in here. Sometimes you actually see double rainbows and double rainbows are inverted rainbows and that requires more reflections in here, okay? Due to an extra reflection inside. So as the first reflection, there is another reflection before it comes in, okay? Comes out of the... Uh, so there is a secondary uh, rainbow in here. Now the concept of total reflection is the following. You have to have a source from the medium with a higher index of reflection. reflection. So the index of reflection must be greater from the source to a lighter from the, where the uh, light needs to be refracted. If you keep on doing this one, well, you can experiment with this one. And it's still true in this case that the index of uh, the, the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection are related to one another. And you can find the math for it. There is no problem with it. At some point, if you do the algebra, you are dealing with the, with the, the arc sine of a number that is more than one. And that doesn't exist because trig functions are between one and two. So in this case, the reflected wave will be completely on the other side in here. So if I am a fish, or if you're trying to hide underwater, all you have to do is just go slightly above. No matter how you go in here, you're not going to be able to see it, OK? As long as you are sitting on this side of the, of the, of the water, OK? You're not going to see it because that requires an, an, a condition more than that. And this is total reflection. So this angle now is a critical angle. Actually, this is the angle that is a critical angle, OK? Anything else is not. So and that is happening for the case of the fish. This it can see, this it can see, but on the other sides, it cannot see. Okay, I mentioned, do I have another prism in here? Complicated devices that use optical devices. The prism is one of them and it's used actually to redirect light, okay? And the telescope and the device that I was showing them, the uh, binoculars I was showing, because light is coming from here, from the source. And it's being collected into here. So this is where you put the eyepiece. And you can even open this one at an even wider range or a smaller range, depending. And as you do that, 
light needs to be somehow redirected back to the eye. For that, you use a prism. Okay. Use a prism inside. In addition to lenses to focus the light to begin with. This is another way of getting light to go through from one point to the other. All of these things that you see are called fiber optics, that they're hair light. So you can use them with a lot of reflection and contain uh, an optical, basically, uh, light in a path, and then that light is transmitted to the other places. This is the principle of fiber, fiber optics that you have in your uh, some uh, internet providers now they use fiber optics. Again, I showed you the examples of a converging lens like this one and a diverging lens like this one, okay? From a diverging lens, a ray that is, comes in parallel is diverged. And uh, the, the converging lens, the ray that is coming in there is going to be converging uh, to some point in here, it converges to some point. So in a place of film in here, it's going to develop because there are the rays that are coming from there where the image is forming. And here, the image appears to be coming from this side, actually, in front of you. So if you place a film in here, there is no image in there to develop. Obviously, this is where the object is. So in this case, the image is virtual. In this case, the image is real. However, you can make also virtual images with lenses. That's exactly what you do in front of your eye if you want to look at some object that is too small. You would want the image to form and to form far away from you, okay? Can I read this stuff in here, for example, in my circuit in here? So if I bring it very close in here, my eye can see it better than if I have just for the regular uh, thing. So in this case, the image is actually formed behind the, uh, the, the, the lens in there. The object is here and the image is pushed away. And that's how I can see that object. That's how your lens actually is seeing. It's not seeing the real object, it's seeing the image that is formed of the object. And that image is amplified, magnified. So in other words, this is what's going on. I have an eye in here, open, and I'm looking at an object. If the object is at infinity, I really don't need a lens, I can see it. But if an object is too tiny, so what I need to do is bring a lens and put it right in here. So the object is small, like for example, a microscope, a micro, so I put it next to a microscope, and then look at the microscope, then the, uh, the, micro, so the, uh, the micro would look like this. The image, in this case, as formed on the other side, on the same side as the object. So it's a virtual image, not real. Because it would have been real if it formed on this side. So what's going on in here is my eye is actually now looking, the lens in my eye is looking at this image, not the actual microbe, the image that is formed by this lens. And it looks big and I can see it now. Without this lens, I cannot because it's too small, okay? So now this image is inverted in my uh, retina and then it's sent to the brain and the brain interprets the different uh, characteristics of that object okay, that I'm looking at. So this is in a sense how useful lenses are. Every lens, like every mirror has a focal point. If I bring rays from infinity, they will all meet into this point. So that's what the focal point is. If I'm looking at it in the opposite direction, if rays are actually coming from this side, for this type of converging lens, they will all converge into a different uh, focal point. These two focal points, they don't necessarily have to be the same, but usually lenses are constructed with symmetry so that the two focal points are the same, okay? Again, I was talking about how the images are formed, they're inverted. This is a pinhole camera. That's a typical one in here. F4 in classes would be fun to build, okay? You don't need any lenses, you don't need anything. You're just basically the cardboard and puncture a hole in it, and you can play with this at home if you want to. Again, this is like a pinhole camera in here. I mean, the, uh, the images that are reflected in here, of course. This is what I was talking about in here. Without a lens, this object in here will be too, uh, will be too, uh, how should I say, too small to be seen. I mean, they talk of flower, but usually we don't use lenses for flowers, for much smaller objects than that. But if you put a lens in front of your eye, then in this case, the image that is formed, usually 
this is wrong, okay? Usually, in, in actually, in when making glasses, the image will form exactly at the focal points. So this is the F for the uh, for the uh, for this lens. So this is, I mean, where do you put the object? You put it at the focal point to have the best uh, focalization. Because if you have it the focal length, the image will form anywhere. It's going to be very far away, and you're going to be relaxed looking at the object. Okay. Because there is a near point. Each and every one of us has a near point. You can try this on your own. Remove the glasses if you have them. Okay. And do this experiment. Take an object. It doesn't matter which, as long as you can focus on. Okay. Focus on that object. They have some details in it. Okay. And see how far you can see it relaxed, not working very hard. You don't have, because the way you are, your eye sees is, if the object is too close to your eye, there is a muscles in here that are gonna pull on the, on the, on the, uh, on the uh, lens that is in your eye, in the cornea actually, there are two muscles in here that are going to pull on it, and to change the focal length so that it can see the object. But then your eye is working hard and the eye gets tired actually from that. So what you do in this case is push the object as far as you can and then bring it closer. The minute you start to see fuzzy things, that is your near point. Each person has a different near point. As you are younger, you have a near point that is closer to your eye. As you get older and older, your near point becomes further and further. That's when you need uh, corrective lenses. Okay. Some people, they need them before that because they have different kind of uh, eye geometry. Either there is a bulge in the, in, the, in the cornea itself that focuses the light before going into the, uh, the, uh, the uh, lens before the retina. So in this case, the picture is not really focused on the retina because the, fo fo the focalization is happening before. Or it could be that the eye is too big. I mean, for the for the the eye socket itself could be too big, slightly bigger, so that the image is still forming before the retina. So this is called a long eye, and you need corrective lenses in this case to bring the to push the picture back into the into the uh, to put the, the image back into the retina. So for that, you need converging uh, converging uh, diverging lenses. You need to push the image back, so you need the diverging lens. That's why when you go to the doctor, he plays around with the different kinds of glasses until he gets you the right gla size glasses. And then you have the image sitting right where it needs to be and your brain is comfortable now looking at the image saying that, hey, this image is fine. Or you could have the opposite problem in a sense that the image is actually forming behind the retina. For a short eye, for example, okay? So what's going on in this case, you need actually converging lens because the image is forming behind the retina. So you need to bring it from there to the front to the retina. So what you do in this case, you have converging lenses like the one I was showing you earlier. And I don't know where I put it now. Not this one. Oh, here it is. So this is our converging lenses. They you use it to bring the image back into the retina again. And there is a number and usually the person who does this, I ask you, okay, how is it from one to 10? Is it better, less? Move back and forth. All they are doing is actually changing the focal length and the type of, 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 of uh, lens to bring it back to where it needs to be until you get the right one, okay? So this is basically in a nutshell, a little bit of uh, stuff that you have in there. This is again, what I was talking about, the images upside down in the eye. And the aberrations, they have to do with the color, basically distortions that are due to the, uh, the, the fact that uh, different lights with different frequencies, uh, they are actually, they have, in other words, the index of refraction depends on the wavelength actually. So the focus, focalization is not happening at the same point, uh, point. And this could be a problem, especially for telescopes that use this type of, uh, of devices in them, okay? So, this is the entire chapter on light. Hopefully you're uh, something useful on optics. And uh, if you guys don't have any question, I'm gonna, going to stop the recording and I'm going to see you Tuesday. Sounds like it's a good plan. Sounds good, thanks for everything. Sure. Thank you guys, thank you.